So when we use the word story, we're often using it synonymously for the word worldview or mindset. Paul speaks about the strongholds of the mind. And what we want to do in these sessions now is look at the power of story to see how powerful world views are, not in only how we see the world through a worldview, but how world views shape our lives and shape the kinds of societies and nations that we will build. I'd like to give you a couple of illustrations as we begin. One is from a friend of mine named Josie. You will notice that uh, many of my stories have names attached to them. It's because of people coming up at conferences and saying, Darrow, I have an illustration for you. So this is Josie's story. Josie graduated from an American university with a degree in nursing. She had a heart for the poor, so she decided to travel to West Africa with the American Peace Corps program. And her assignment was to teach microbiology in an African nursing college. She had never taught before. She was very excited about what she was going to do. And uh, she began this semester by teaching an overview of biology. And then from there she narrowed it down to microbiology and from there she narrowed it down to germ theory. Her students studied very hard and at the end of the semester they all passed the test, the final test, and uh, Josie was uh, pleased that they had done so well and that her first teaching assignment had gone so well. But she asked uh, the students to evaluate the class so that next time she taught, she'd be able to make improvement on what she did. And during the evaluation, one of the, the students raised their hand and said, Miss Josie, thank you for teaching us what white people believe about how you get sick. Now would you like to know how people really get sick? Well, Josie was stunned because what they'd been talking about all semester was how you really got sick. And uh, she said, yes, tell me, how do you really get sick? And this uh, African nursing student said, yeah, here in Africa, we understand there's a spiritual realm. And somebody can put a curse on you and the curse can make you sick. Or there are witches, and the witches come out at night, and they fly to your house, come into your bedroom and bite you on the back, and that's how you really get sick. What had Josie not taken into account when she began teaching the course? She had not taken into account worldview. In fact, she had never heard the term. In fact, it was years later when she heard me lecturing that for the first time in her life, she heard the word worldview and began to make a connection to those years before when she was teaching in Africa and how there was a disconnect between what she was teaching and what the students were hearing. Josie was a materialist and she was looking at illness from a materialistic perspective. And in a materialistic perspective, everything has to be, de be defined in material terms. So the root of physical illness is always a physical condition, and the solution to the physical problem is to use drugs or knives. Her students believed that there was a spiritual realm and that there could be a spiritual cause of physical illness. 
And this was totally beyond the imagination of Josie or a Western mind. Worldviews are powerful. Here you had Josie and her students looking at the same thing, illness, but coming to two totally different understandings based on their different worldviews. Another example came from the uh, 1400s. There was a Portuguese prince named Henry, and he was nicknamed the Navigator. He was nicknamed the Navigator because he wanted to explore the world. One of the things that Henry wanted to do was find a sea route from Europe to India. And so he commissioned a ship and a captain and provisioned the ship, called a priest in to bless the ship, and the ship sailed down the west coast of Africa to try and find a sea route to India. A couple of weeks later it came back to port and the captain of the boat came to Prince Henry's throne room and he said, Prince Henry, I'm sorry we could not find a sea route to India because we came to the end of the world. Well, Henry was not to be determined, to be deterred, so he sent another ship and another ship, and over the course of 10 years, he sent out 13 ships, and they all came back with the same story, saying that they had come to the end of the world. But Henry sent out a 14th ship with a captain who had already come to the end of the world, as it were, and as this ship was uh, sailing along the west coast of Africa, a major storm came up and the ship was blown out into the Atlantic Ocean. And after a period of time when the storm had died, the captain could no longer see the coast of Africa, so he set sail to the uh, east and after a few days, they came to the coast of Africa and realized that they were past the end of the world. And it was this breakthrough that allowed the eventual discovery of the sea route from Europe to India. What had happened to the other ships? They had come to a point in what is today the Spanish Sahara where the desert moves out into the Atlantic Ocean and there is a huge sandbar. And over this sandbar there are strange currents and of course as a ship would approach the sandbar, the water under the keel would get shallower and shallower and between the water getting shallower and the strange currents, the conclusion of the men on the ship was that they had come to the end of the world. But had they come to the end of the world? No. Where was the end of the world? It was in their mind. In those days, if you sailed too far to the west or too far to the south, it was thought you'd come to the edge of the world and fall off. And that's what these sailors thought. What limited their discovery? Not reality. What limited their discovery was the map in their mind. Every single person in this world has a map in their mind. It's a map that tells them what the world is like. And we can call this a worldview or a mindset Scientists call it paradigm. There's a number of different words that we can use synonymously, but it's the idea that we are wearing a set of glasses on our mind. Many of us wear glasses or contact lenses on our eyes, and it's these glasses that allow us to see and hopefully see more clearly. 
Well, every one of us is wearing a set of glasses on our mind. The trouble is, we don't know it. Many of us are born again in our hearts, but we're not born again in our minds. Our minds have been set by our culture. In the West, by a materialistic culture, in much of Africa and the Americas and Asia, it has been shaped by an animistic culture. But we have these glasses on our mind and we never look at them. I don't know about you, but I, at the end of my day, I'll go into the restroom, I'll brush my teeth and do the other things that I do. Then I'll go sit on the edge of my bed and I'll take my glasses off and put them next to the bed and I go to sleep. And what's the first thing I do in the morning? I pick up my glasses and I put them on and I forget about them. But all day long I look through my glasses. What do I not do? I do not look at my glasses. And I don't ask you to look at my glasses. No, I look through them. And we never take time to examine our glasses. That is why we're going through this material now to help you understand that you have a set of glasses on your mind. And those glasses not only shape how you see the world, they will determine the kind of communities and the kind of um, nations that you will build. Think back to Josie. Josie was wearing a secular set of glasses. And her students were wearing an animistic set of glasses. They were looking at the same thing, health, and came to two totally different conclusions. Let's turn to Romans 12.2. Paul says, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be not conformed any longer to the pattern of the world. For those of us in the West, let's not be conformed any longer to our Western materialistic consumer-oriented culture. To those in Africa or Asia, be not conformed to the pattern of your world. But what? Be transformed. And how are you transformed? By the renewing of your mind. What God is saying, it's not enough to be born again in your heart as long as you have a pagan mind. We need to be born again, again. We need to be born again in our heart, and then we need to have our mind born again. If we lived at a time of history where we had a biblical worldview, you wouldn't be talking about being born again, again. But we live in a time where a materialistic worldview dominates most of the Western world, and an animistic worldview dominates most of the developing world. And because of that, when we come to Christ, we come through the lens of our materialistic or animistic worldview. So we need to have the lenses in our glasses changed. God wants, God has ground lenses for our glasses that allow us to see reality the way He has made it. So when we come to Christ, it's not just to be born again in our hearts. We need to be born again in our minds. 
And very often that is a conscious process of changing the lenses in our glasses. One of the things I'd like you to reflect on, people can take courses at universities. There's all sorts of organizations that are teaching on worldview. But what is the difference between looking at worldview as an academic subject and looking at worldview as the lens by which we examine and solve grassroots problems. These are two different processes and I would like you to reflect on the difference between these two. <laughs>